in Washington. <clears throat> um, and I think this raises two questions, which we can discuss. Who, so question number one is, who are Trump supporters? Who are they? Question number one. <clears throat> And given that they are, generally speaking, from the far right, um, who is, who, well, what are, what constitutes the far right in the United States of America? So this is the American context. So who votes for Trump? Who voted for Trump? Who are Trump supporters? And um, who are these far right supporters in America? And I stress America because it's a different world to Europe. <clears throat> um, I don't think you can say this, it's called Searchlight. Searchlight, it's all back to front writing. The Searchlight is a magazine which people may know about, which investigates and sur surveys and keeps an eye on the far right across the world. Um, and uh, in, in this month's edition, there's an article on Trump's far right legacy. So I recommend Searchlight to people. You can, it's online. It's a very good um, anti-fascist magazine, which exposes fascist and far right activity in Britain, Europe, America and indeed in India. <clears throat> it's, a, it's very worth reading. And there's another great book called Fascism <clears throat> by Roger Griffin, um, who who's, gives a very good account of the nature of fascism <clears throat> because the term is used rather loosely to mean anything nasty on the far right and that they aren't, they aren't coterminous. <clears throat> Anyway, so <clears throat> first question, and then we can discuss this in detail. Who, who voted for Trump? Well, he had a diverse constituency, but an, a couple of features stand out. <clears throat> is that a large number of white Protestants of the, of the evangelical kind voted for Trump, so there's quite clearly a religious divide. White people of European extraction who are Protestants voted for Trump. We can come back to that later on because it's about the, the evangelical movement, uh, which um, has some, um, is deeply rooted in racism and white supremacy. <clears throat> Interestingly, he also attracted a third of the voters who were who are called in the United States, um, they're called Asians or Hispanics, people from South America, Central America, people from South Asia in particular, or East East Asia. Um, a third of those voters voted for Trump. The number of black voters, uh, black Americans. Um, only eight percent of those voted for Trump, and and uh, and in terms of education uh, and wealth, there's no conclusive evidence. A, a lot of rich people, a lot of educated people, voted for Trump. On balance, not quite so. But you should be surprised that uh, the incomes of Trump voters. Um, varied enormously, not just poor whites, but also very rich people as well. Um, so his constituency um, is quite varied. A few themes are emerging, one of which is this Christian association and uh, a strong link with, with um, Protestants in particular. <clears throat> so it's been it's been quite well researched. Who voted for Trump? We can discuss that later if you wish. <clears throat> so, who are these far right groups which are linked to Trump? 
One of the themes of the far right in America is its diversity. Uh, they coalesce under Trump, but they are quite diverse in their nature. And I'll just go through, I've identified about nine different categories. <clears throat> nine different cat categories. <clears throat> um, the first category is what's called a group of people called preppers. Preppers is a short, it's a slang word for preparation for the apocalypse. Preppers, people who prepare, believe that the world is coming to an end and that civilization is collapsing and they, they're going to live in their, in their bunkers, they're going to survive the apocalypse. Um, there are many thousands of preppers in the United States that are armed to the teeth, their houses are full of stocks of food, they aim to live after the collapse of civilization in a state of warfare. So these are the preppers. They tend to have cabins in the forests, in the mountains, um, and there are prepper communities all around the United States. <clears throat> So that's one group who are attracted to Trump. There's some obvious groups, the white supremacists. The white supremacist groups um, are part of Trump's entourage. There are two sorts of white supremacists. <clears throat> There's the old fashioned white supremacists who believe in straightforward racism. There's a hierarchy and which the white man with our white women are at the top. That's what we're very familiar with. Um, but they, they, they exist in a pluralist society. They accept that society is diverse, except it's, high, it's, it's made into a hierarchy on which they are at the top and get all the resources and all the benefits. Mm. This is different to what are called white nationalists White nationalists have similar ideas, but they believe that there should be a white only state. In other words, uh, they seek to build, in fact, they advocate a white only state to become another state of America. Um, obviously they're linked to white supremacy, but their ambition is to have a white only society. <clears throat> non-white people are to be removed and expelled. <clears throat> so white nationalists are kind of a subgroup of white supremacists, but they've got, got a particular take. <clears throat> we have the Ku Klux Klan, and Tom sent round an article um, on the different periods of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, post-Civil War, then 1920s and 30s, and of course, with the civil rights movement of the 60s, this is the third, third iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, they are, of course, white supremacists. Some are preppers, um, but, <clears throat> but they have a distinctive approach to life, uh, which in, normally involves a great deal of violence towards black people, using terror and threats to, um, to attack black people. Uh, but they are a distinct group. <clears throat> We have then another group who call themselves neo-Nazis. Um, these are a group of people who worship Nazi Germany and they worship Hitler and they're characterized by deep hatred, not just of black people and black Americans, but in particular, they hate Jews, they hate gay people and they hate disabled people. Um, they are neo-Nazis in, in the sense that they actively wear the insignia of Nazis, swastikas and the like. Um, they form paramilitary militia. Um, they go around with their guns um, and, they, and they kill people. Um, <clears throat> strong links to the Ku Klux Klan, but they are a distinct group. <clears throat> um, there's another group 
uh, who are called neo-confederates. The neo-confederates um, are those from the old southern states um, who are still white, still fighting the civil war. Um, they have a particular narrative that the southern states were betrayed by the northern states, that the civil war was a war of justice um, and pride. <clears throat> um, and they believe in what's called the lost cause. They believe in the right of the southern states to be their own type of society and they seek to reinstate the southern way of life, uh, which of course at the time included slavery. <clears throat> um, so this is a, a neo-confederates who wear their, uh, who take pride in the civil, civil war generals and that sort of thing. And they protect their statues of civil war heroes um, very strongly. So these were neo-confederates. They have links to the Ku Klux Klan, um, some are neo-Nazis, are all interconnected, but I'm trying to draw out the different strands. And then another group uh, is called the alt-right, the alt-right, A-L-T, right. -right uh, this is another group which began to emerge in 2008. Um, uh, their particular hatred is of, is of Muslims. Um, they are anti-feminist, they are anti-egalitarian, um, they are anti-pluralism. But the alt-right is a distinct group out with all those others. Um, they believe the world is controlled by a global elite. In many cases, they believe to be Jewish um, and, and they seek to defend what they call their their nation. And this links up, links up to that other strange group of people called QAnon. QAnon um, is another version of the old alt-right groups. But QAnon, um, as I'm sure you're aware, believes there's a worldwide conspiracy of pedophiles um, who were infiltrating America. Uh, often led by Jewish people yet again. Um, they are anti-globalization, anti-neoliberalism. Anti um, they see a global conspiracy by the elite um, trying to undermine nation states, QAnon. Um, um, so so the, the, this is a range of people <clears throat> um, who have come together under Trump's umbrella. Um, and there's another group, which I've just briefly mentioned, and, and that is what's become called the so-called left behind or, the, or, the, or the, the abandoned. So we talk about the Rust Belts of America, where the white working class has been abandoned by neoliberalism. Uh, their jobs have uh, migrated to other countries especially to Mexico and Central America and elsewhere. Um, and these are discontented white working classes, the so-called Rust Belt, Rust Belt voters, who also appeal, who Trump appealed to. So, so Trump's constituency um, is, on the, is on the far right. Um, it's a diverse group of people. So, so one question is, is, um, do we describe this group of people as fascists or what are they? So that's another debate to be had. Um, in what sense are they fascist? They certainly have, if you look at classic definitions of fascism, they have similarities, um, a belief in a, myth, a mythical past, which has been somehow, somehow been undermined and defiled, um, a mythical alternation which needs to re-emerge again. <clears throat> so that's one aspect, but conversely, America is a land of what's called rugged individualism. Many of these groups are very strongly anti-statist. They, the, they reject the role of the state um, to control people's lives. They're fiercely independent of their own individual rights. 
And of course, fascism is linked to statism. So to what extent is it useful to call these people fascists? Let's have that debate. So I'll stop there. So, so two questions. Who were these people who attacked Congress last week? It's called a coup. It was ne it's never a coup. It's just a disruption. There's no, there's no, with a coup, you have in place a group of people ready to take over the government. I don't think these people were taking over the government. They had no one in place. It was just um, anarchy and the anger. <clears throat> uh, maybe the other people know differently. Um, and their violence <clears throat> provoked by Trump. Um, um, so who are these people who, who, who are Trump supporters? Um, and uh, how, what makes sense of this diverse group of people um, under the one umbrella? Um, and that, that, of course, then leads to the next question, what happens next? So I'll stop there um, to give people a chance to explore the issue in more depth from their different perspectives. Believe. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Could you, why, why are they, America was never, uh, never became a socialist country, uh, and this goes back to the Cold War. Is that, is that part of it, because of the, America's role in the, uh, in the Cold War, that, that's why they're anti-communist? Well, it, it predates that, it predates that. Um, communism, there, there, there has been an, an American Communist Party, um, uh, in the 20s and 30s and even earlier. And there have been socialist movements, uh, but they've fallen upon thorny ground um, for, for a variety of reasons. Communism and socialism um, has never taken, taken foot in the United States of America. Um, that's not entairly true. Um, there, have been, there have been progressive movements which have had a socialist character but they struggle in America because of extreme individualism, which is a part of the mythology of, of, of the frontier. It's called rugged individualism, um, based upon the, the mass immigration of Europeans uh, and the expansion westwards um, to build what they call frontier towns and frontier states at the expense of indigenous people. So um, there, there were, of course, the Wobblies um, which was a socialist, Marxist-inspired movement. They still exist. Uh, but it's a, a worldwide trade union movement, the Wobblies. Uh, but the appeal of socialism and communism in America is very, very small for all sorts of historical reasons. So um, you're dead right. Uh, and of course, in America, they call anyone a commie who believes in, say, Public health. Uh, they, they call anyone a commie in America if you believe that people should get benefits. Um, so any anything an inch to the left of the centre in America is called socialist and is called communist. I have a very strange sense of these two of these two words. Uh, anything which involves um, helping others is called communism and socialism. It's a different world, so we need to be careful when we use language. It means different things in different places. Um, what we call what we call left to centre socialism, social democracy, for example, like Starmer's Labour Party these days. Anything slightly anything slightly left to centre or dead centre, they would call communism socialism. Um, they have a different different viewpoint. <clears throat> Thank you. Naeem? Yeah, and I think for, first of all, on this issue of fascism, whether it, what happened was fascist or not, I mean, it's a, it's a common thing that we do, isn't it? We, we compare everything to our past historical experience and fascism was the most drastic experience we had. It's the same as we do on Palestine. We say, you know, it's an apartheid state. Uh, it, it has got a lot of similarities with fascism in terms of the use of force, the military power, uh, and also the ideology in many ways does correspond because it is racist. 
uh, it, it may not, you know, it depends how we define fascism. It may, may or may not be fascism in that sense. The, the, the main thing was that, you know, in Britain, we said that the threat that we need to fight about racism is not really coming from the ultra-right organizations because they demonstrate and they do few things which are spectacular, but really the racism that affects us most is the one that comes, uh, you know, institutionalized racism from this various organizations in the state, the police, for example, or the judiciary and, uh, you know, in, in the system of education and everything else is much more significant and worth fighting for on a daily basis. Or well, I think the American experience probably proved that's slightly different because, you know, they they actually went into the uh, into the Capitol building, isn't it? They went into the Citadel of Power. And I think from what they were saying today, uh, there were some people who were actually thinking of assassinating a few of the uh, yeah. congressmen, yeah. Uh, including the vice president, probably. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, and also I think, even though, you know, they were not able to take state power uh, and they made themselves think that they weren't going to take state power, you know, last week or whatever, but certainly their objective is to get state power at some stage. Uh, and what this has shown is that this is probably not going to be the last time it's happened. It's going to occur more and more in the United States. They will establish their presence, they established their influence. Uh, and I think the, the state itself is worried about it because that's why they're impeaching him. Uh, so I think, you know, it's uh, state power is still there. And I think also it's not, you know, th there are different types of uh, ultra-right organizations in the United States. Uh, th th there are organizations uh, particularly the Christian Zionists, for example, all right? They, uh, they ultimately mean harm to the Jewish people, but they're actually working with, with the Israeli state. So I think that's, that's another thing we need to consider. Yeah, yeah Saif. Thanks, Paul. Uh, for that interaction. So regarding the first question, can you guys hear me? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So regarding, yes. Yeah, regarding the first question, it's, uh, it's really interesting to notice that the, emphas the, the emphasis on race is becoming weaker gradually among the Trump supporters. So you have people who are, uh, who are as Paul mentioned, they are Asians. Uh, and there are people who are coming, who are blacks, and there are people who are coming from South Asia, generally the Brahminist Indians, who see Trump as some sort of, as, as addressing some sort of grievance that they have uh, with the society or addressing some sort of issue. So this, this strict emphasis on the race is waning. The other thing is that if you interact with, if, or if you follow any of their, whatever their posts, etc. Uh, on social media, you will see that that they emphasize alternative theories to the present uh, mainstream political theories. So one of the one of the one of the intellectual figures among them is Alexander Dugin. I'm not sure if people know Alexander Dugin. Dugin uh, is a Russian uh, who has people claim that he is close to Putin. Uh, we don't know. But uh, he has been writing, he has been proposing these kind of theories, which are, which mix uh, 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 not outrightly fascistic ideas, but some sort of fascistic idea with Bolshevik ideas. So you will see people and groups and parties emerging around Dugin's ideas, which call themselves uh, nationalist Bolshevik or Nazbol or something like that, or of that particular variations. And they propose uh, a theory which they call fourth political theory. That is the political theory which is outside of the liberal democratic framework. It's outside of a Marxist framework and it's also outside of the fascist framework. So one of the key features of these people is this. 
I mean, not I'm not talking about all of the Trump supporters, but I'm talking about a significant ideologically motivated uh, section of Trump supporters. The other thing that they are they propose is that they are not racist because they are not talking about race supremacy. Race supremacy. They are uh, culturally uh, they want to establish uh, dominant. They want to establish or reestablish dominance of a culture which is innately superior compared to other cultures. And by that, what they mean is that European culture fundamentally is superior compared to other cultures. And therefore, you will see black people who are Trump supporters, and they would say that we don't want to go back to Africa to whatever our ancestors were doing, that whatever they were doing. That was the inferior stage of human civilization. The civilizational state or stage that we have reached is much more superior. So we need to maintain, reestablish these civilizational values. Mm. And this is this when we when we are discussing this, it's quite important to not just simply put them into a category of being racist, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. There is a very highly uh, ideologically motivated section, which is supporting Trump as a figurehead. And you in some ways, using that particular momentum to uh, to to forward their agenda. Yeah, I mean that, that yeah, that's quite right. So when, when I talked about, I mean, we could have talked about the fourth, the fourth way. <clears throat> I mean, I put it very pithily. I, I simply said that they're a very diverse group of people have coalesced under Trump's um, umbrella. Uh, but it, I mean, let, let's be clear about uh, at a risk of importing a European concept. Let's be clear about what is para-fascist or neo-fascist about these movements. Um, all these movements believe that there was a kind of a mythical period in the past when civilization flourished, typically a white civilization. Um, it's a golden era um, that has been corrupted for a variety of means. Um, and, and they wish to renew and reinstate this golden age. Um, uh, you know, the, the idea of how America used to be, it, 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 it is fueled by global capitalism and its international nature. Um, it, is, um, it is a critique of the liberal state, um, uh, which is, I think the point you were making there, Saif, um, it, 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 it is not just a critique of a liberal state, it's also a critique of global capitalism. <clears throat> um, so this puts them in a very strange economic, political, ideological position. And this is why it's rather complicated. But a recent piece of research done in America um, reveals that the greatest fear, the greatest fear of white Americans, meaning by that Americans of European extraction, uh, European ancestry, their greatest fear is, is, is the, they're losing their majority status. By the year 2040, it, it is estimated that that original European stock, which populated America um, initially will become the minority group of people in the United States. The majority group will be those or not those, Hispanic origin, so-called Latinos, um, Black Americans, um, and, and, and people of so-called Asian origin, East, South, Central Asia, um, Japanese. Um, um, this is there's this great fear of being swamped, I use the word swamped in inverted commas, um, and a fear of what's called mis miscegenation, the mixing of races. So it is quite true that this idea um, is manifest in all sorts of non-racist ways. Uh, the underpinning fear is one of race and one of diluting, polluting the white stock um, and this is clearly uh, linked to fascist 
a fascist mentality. Um, uh, the, the emergence of militia, um, some research has suggested that in the past five years in America, there, there, there are now 24,000 militia type people in the United States who go around with their guns um, and of which the obvious manifestation are what are called the Proud Boys. The Proud Boys are a bunch of thugs who carry weaponry, dressed in paramilitary uniforms, and they go along and support Trump rallies. Um, as there have been a hundred incidents in the past year where Black Life, where Black Life Matters um, protests and Black Lives Matter assemblies, um, Black Lives Matter meetings have been attacked by the Proud Boys. Um, so um, this is akin to Nazi Germany in the 20s and 30s when, when the so-called so black shirts um, went around disrupting other meetings with violence, um, killing people, maiming people. Um, so, so the use of street violence, which is, I think, one of the main points, the use of street violence um, by these groups is increasingly common. And just as in Nazi Germany or, the, or before Hitler's rise to power, the, the organs of the state, the army, the police, um, contain many supporters of these groups. So you may realise, of course, that um, last week in Washington, um, there's evidence that the local police force encouraged the invasion. Some individual coppers did. Now, there, there are shots of, shots of police officers taking selfies with these people. Um, uh, the, the infiltration of the police force by these people um, is quite high. Um, and as we know from Black Lives Matters, uh, the police force attracts the worst sort of white supremacist racists. Um, and, and as people, ke people keep pointing out, if you compare the mobilization of state forces against Black Lives Matter meetings, uh, which is violence disruptive meetings, and you look at the lukewarm response of the state forces against these people until very late in the day, it illustrates the difference. So, um, in my view, uh, America is a deeply racist society, um, and uh, and Trump Trump feeds upon this this racism. Uh, it takes many forms, um, but all these diverse groups try to reimagine a society where they are again at the top of, at the top of their hierarchy or indeed in some cases they remove non-white people entirely, um, uh, which is absolutely fascist in nature. It, it's what fascists do by identifying an enemy within and their job is to expel them. Um, so we have to be cautious about the word fascism in the context of America, but there are some powerful similarities which we need to bear in mind, yeah. Thank you for that. It's uh, quite an interesting discussion. Um, I think what, what we have to understand is the nature of American democracy. And, and, and we have to question the premise of the democracy they have. And, and, and whatever form of democracy they have, it has a purpose to maintain uh, the state and, and, and the players in the state. American is, act, is, is, a, is a, a corporate run country. And within the corporates, there is antagonism between sections of corporations. And when one section feels threatened, uh, you know, uh, and, and that they might lose the votes, then the other corporation will come up with various slogans and, and try and win the votes in order to 
give the impression that there is dem democracy that exists. Now, Trump came into power on the, on the card, if I'm not, uh, basically that I'm going to stop wars, that we are wasting too much money and I'm going to bring my troops back and, and so forth. And, and, and it is a matter of record that Trump hasn't actually sent additional troops uh, against uh, foreign nations uh, to invade, unlike his predecessors, you know, who did completely the opposite. And, and that was, that, and, and then, you know, Trump's slogan <clears throat> that I want to make uh, America great again, uh, resonated with the people who, as a result of capitalist uh, economy and, and, and run by corporations for the benefits of the, the few, 10% uh, of whatever. Um, and when the 90% are been suffering and losing jobs and have no health and education suffering and all manners of uh, ills are, 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 were there to be seen. And when Trump starts talking about, you know, I want to bring back jobs from China, you know, I want to create this and do that. Uh, this is how uh, the Trump uh, side of corporations won the, 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 the previous election. And of course, he was unable to deliver the promises he made. You know, he gave massive taxes, uh, tax cuts to the corporations, but he did so at all in terms of creating employment and in so all in terms of creating, you know, education benefits and, you know, and, and, and he has a complete miserable failure in handling the COVID crisis. So, 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 this is what gave the Democrats the leverage this time to actually win, win, win that vote, win the votes against them. But, but both, both camps, Democrats and Republicans, uh, actually use the same, play the same card, you know, and they are fascistic in nature. And, and I think it's, it's wrong to actually keep comparing uh, today's neo-fascism or to today's manifestations of fascism to, 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 to Hitler, you know? Uh, if you had looked at Hitler before 1932, before he came to power, I think, you know, he, he had the tendencies of fascism, but nobody actually understood them to be fascistic in nature. It is only when he actually you know, came to power and started doing what, the, the horrific things he did that we said, oh, this is fascism. But here, given half the chance, we have these establishment tending towards that, 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 that kind of rule, because at the end of the day, in order to protect their empire, they will resort to all sorts of things, you know? And, and 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 to them, to the to the capitalist and the, and the corporations, the biggest threat is the left and other the communists and the socialists. And 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 coming back to what Abu raised earlier, and and, and it is very true that they are staunchly anti-communists. And, and 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 you know after the Second World War. The Communist Party in America was at a very big strength. In fact, I think that if I remember my history, uh, is that they probably had more than one third, more than a half of the elected representatives from the Communist Party. And, and it was they and the, it was the communist and the trade unions, the socialists that gave an ultimatum to Roosevelt, I think it was at the time, and saying, look, you know, if you don't want a revolution on your hand, you have to start creating employment. And 
and and and that that if you don't provide employment because you know th there was that uh, economic crisis at the time capitalism had collapsed and and so they started pumping in a hell of a lot of money started creating roads and hospitals and schools and and generated jobs and once america got back on its feet again that was when the state power started saying uh, started this mccarthyism you know it started uh, targeting all the communists and, and things like that and discredited them and and that was a horrific period and and it uh, of uh, wiping out communists from america um but following on from that what they did that they, they made sure that every institution the disneylands the education the film industry they they made ensure that you know no uh, socialist kind of or working class films were ever made you know and and it is very very difficult to find uh, movies in the hollywood with the big industry in the, the film industry in the world to find films that depict class struggle you know so so and that to me actually uh, putting down or suppressing a viewpoint of of one viewpoint being socialistic viewpoint or marxist viewpoint is a fascistic characteristic and that is actually continuing today and i just want to very very quickly uh, come on to uh, this business about why are the the the, the asians uh, from from asia why are they very staunchly uh, pro trump uh it is it is because they themselves are very very anti communist anti socialistic uh, in line with the bjp uh mode, mode of thinking so I, i think there's a lot of points i wanted to actually make but i think i'm not taking up too much of your time and i'll let somebody else come in thank you um paul for the introduction um you know we keep talking about is this fascism or will it be fascism i'm not sure whether that's the only question we should be asking because even if it isn't fascism you know if we look at america and most of the sort of european countries that've been steadily moving towards the right ever since you know the 1950s or so and you know even though we now you know have biden he's i don't think he's going to be any less vicious in terms of economic um structures and things and you know we could never have imagined that that would have happened in in america and here you know here it is so you know we might not get fascism but we might get very some some something similar or much more of a stronger move towards a dictatorial state um that controls mm -hmm. people's lives so much more stringently than you know we've been used to and also that the sort of far right now that they've done that in america i think it there is a big danger now that other other countries even in europe and stuff the far right in their various elements might follow the same examples and you know that and and we as non white people are going to be um bear the brunt of that i think mm. well it's happening in hungary and romania for example already can i just pick up point made by lek which is a very important point <clears throat> is that and this is true also of brexit the capitalism is not a uh united body of people um there are different capitalist camps often based upon national outlook and they compete um there's there, there are wars between capitalists and and uh trump is one such capitalist out of power so well what 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 capitalists do in this war between themselves between corporate capitalisms what they do 
is that uh, the one side seeking to gain power um, for their own purposes uh, obscures the economic basis of their fight for supremacy and they translate their arguments into cultural issues. So <coughs> what happens is, is that uh, the outer power capitalists like Trump, the so-called anti-establishment capitalists, will acculturize the debate in, as a form of popularism to get the votes of those who, to, who find that appealing. So, so the debate in America, which Trump started, was not the actual underlying economic struggle between capitalists. He made it into a cultural issue between peoples. So in other words, he talked about immigrants taking jobs, that sort of thing. Um, talked about China taking over the world. You know, he, he used xenophobia and racism um, against non-white populations to foment his case. Um, that is true in the Brexit arguments uh, to acculturize the underlying tensions of capitalism for one side or the other. Um, and in that sense, he was very successful, um, uh, which explains, of course, why um, he's managed to attract a large number of, of, of bourgeois um, people uh, who came from Asia or from Latin America, who had done quite nicely um, as success stories. Um, so, so, and of course, what Hitler did was to was to um, obscure the economic issues by focusing upon cultural issues. In this, in this case, anti-Semitism and so on and so forth um, to foment their case. So, it's the old standard trick, isn't it, to, of the economic base, uh, as it were, the, the actual tensions or contradictions of the economic base being explored and argued through superstructural, i.e. cultural issues, which is what Trump did very nicely. But of course, he had no economic arguments and economically um, he's come to, he's come to um, struggle to maintain his credibility. What he's got left are cultural issues, uh, which are becoming thinner and thinner in terms of their strength of the arguments. So this notion of competing capitalisms World War One and World War Two were a fight between capitalists. Um, uh, it, it assumed the, the narrative of, of human rights and protecting minorities and it, all that kind of stuff. It was a, it was a war between capitalists, um, which ordinary people were drawn into, um, and that's what we've been seeing in America as well. So you know, I'm just trying to expand upon next point, which I think is a very important one. Yeah. James, you had to unmute, yeah. Unmute. You had to unmute. Oh, just unmuted, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, um, just, just ch changing the focus, well, not necessarily, um, but if you go back um, to the beginning of the, the, the election period, the last election period, um, it, it, you, you've got a, you, the, the whole primary thing for the Republicans. Um, it, it, it looked at the beginning as that Trump was a total outsider. There was no way, he was just a bit of a joke um, to a great extent. And there were all these other um, mainly right wing, um, but not lunatic um, characters or semi lunatic, not quite as lunatic as Trump, as Trump um, competing uh, for the Republican nomination. And it was totally, um, unbelievable that Trump would get the nomination. I mean, I don't know what the odds against him were, but somebody must have made a lot of money. Um, and it was totally unbelievable that he would um, not only get the nomination, but also win the election. And, and it's, there's a similarity there around about the same time with Brexit. Um, that again, the, the, all the um, commentators, the, the general idea was, there's no way that, um, that the referendum is gonna go uh, in, in favor of, of the leavers. Um, and that to, to a great extent was because the, the, the essential um, interests of 
uh, the monopoly capitalists in the UK and in the USA were uh, to have the, the, the sort of status quo continuing um, of um, uh, uh, one um, uh, a right wing or, or, or centre centre right um, uh, politicians um, who they could control and who did what the monopoly capitalists wanted, um, and and um, they didn't want Trump, they didn't want Brexit, but they were stuck with this thing called democracy, uh, this strange system which the um, European capitalist powers um, <clears throat> have evolved, um, which of course is not, um, it, it, not it's not um, power to the people, it's not controlled by the people, uh, it, wh whichever way it is, whether it's one man, one vote, or one person, one vote, um, it, it, and it's like a something that happens every five years or something that happens uh, occasionally where people have, have an opportunity to select between the two worst of two evils and having done that they're stuck with that or the best of two evils perhaps and then they're stuck with that um, uh, uh, representative for the next five years um, and it, it's absolutely nothing to do with people's control at all but it's a system to which they're ideologically committed because they think it's great to say, oh, we're not like China, we're not like uh, the Soviet Union, or even we're not like Hitler. Um, we're liberal democratic. But of course, it, it isn't democratic at all, but it, nonetheless, they've stuck with it. So come, something comes along like Trump and uh, because of this, this system, um, he, gets, he gets the vote. And um, he got the vote in, even in this election on the figures, as far as we know them, he still got 70 odd million people voting for him. So that's 70 odd, 70 odd million people, nearly half of the population in the States still want Trump uh, to be there. And it's pretty obvious that the, the monopoly capitalist control um, in, in the United States doesn't doesn't want him to be there. But so th but that that's something which has developed um, in in this recent period, um, and it's developing. So you lost Jim. Um, Paul said, you know, the, the, the World War One, World War Two was capitalist war. I think, I think it was, we were, yeah, I, I was led to believe that it was a war of uh, imperialism, because there's one imperialist power fighting the other. That yeah. was the basic of, of uh, Second World War and First World War. Same uh, but thing. Obviously, there were, there were obviously capitalist interests behind it at all. But that's what that, and, 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 the, and the question that, that, you know, we have a democracy. I think that is 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 is, is it's never emphasized in the Western world that this is actually bourgeois democracy. It is not people's democracy, because at best you will uh, elect a the person who favors capitalism and wants to maintain the model of capitalism. Uh, so so that's why it's actually called bourgeois democracy. And 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 what Jim was saying that that you know they are stuck with it. I don't think they're stuck with it. They actually they actually promote this bourgeois democracy because that's the one way they have of maintaining themselves in power. Uh, the the other point I was wanted to make that you know there are various camps between the the, the corporate or the monopoly capitalist, you know, there, there are camps and they do, whilst they will, they contend with each other, they also collaborate with each other to maintain the system uh, that they have. And, 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 and people have asked the question, you know, uh, this, this, what happened on the 6th in, in, uh, in January, 
you know, why was the police so so flimsy in 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 preventing these um, these rioters going into into the White House? You know, um, how come they actually knew where to go and how to how to go about it? You know, uh, was it was there an actual uh, state uh, collaboration? In letting these people into the system, into into that, uh, was the Democrats, you know, the CIA who now seems to be favoring the Democrats, you know, were they behind it all? And 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 one of the the theories that's being put forward is that, uh, you know, Democrats although had seemingly seemingly won the elections, they weren't actually that very popular in coming to power anyway. Uh, because, you know, what possible record have they got to persuade the uh, anybody that they're going to be any better than what Obama was for the, for the previous 10 years? So in order to actually legitimize their, their, uh, their taking into office, coming into office, it, it, you know, they actually use this thing and perhaps played a hand in in this Whitehall take so-called takeover, uh, and and now they can actually say, look, you know, we are the real defenders of democracy, you know, and and, and uh, you know, so that this is all. The, there's going to be all sorts of drama now in in in, in the legal system of uh, you know uh, how they have prevented insurrections and things like that. So, you know, they. On the one hand, the, the state, you know, there are the, there's the states, there's the judiciary, there's the legislation, you know, and, and there are contentions and, uh, between, you know, some factions will support one monopoly capacity, the other faction will support the other faction. So I wouldn't be too surprised that if there was an actually an orchestrated uh, hand, orchestrating hand in all this, you know, because it's quite unbelievable to see you know, uh, you know, uh, policemen taking selfies. You know, uh, with, with these uh, so-called fascists and things like that. So it it, it was quite a, a worrying drama in in a way, and I don't think there was any intention of actually a takeover or a coup. It was just a, a, a drama to emphasize that now we are we are back to democracy. James, can you continue, James? James, can you continue? You are up, disrupted. Yeah, I, my, I've got. I'm sorry, my connection is very bad. It keeps going. Um, uh, I, I, um, I think. Part, yeah. Okay. Just, just to finish off what I was saying, um, the the point is that um, we're talking about Trump supporters, um, and um, Paul has has you know very help helpfully gone through the, the groups of right-wing um, extreme supporters. But the fact is that it, the people that voted um, Trump were actually just voting, mainly just voting Republican. And there's still that, that divide. Um, and and they, the majority of people who, who voted um, and did, wouldn't particularly have wanted Trump, in my opinion, um, but they wanted a Republican. They didn't want a Democrat. Mm. Um, and and uh, whatever's happened now, uh, Trump uh, having lost this election, um, and these um, small group of people. Gone again. Oh. <laughs> wars being the capitalist wars, of course. I meant by that imperialism being the latest stage of capitalism as described by Lenin. But um, a simple answer to the other point raised by Leck about how come this was allowed to happen was it's just called white privilege. But white people are allowed to get away with things black people aren't. So there's an awful lot of footage showing how Black Lives Matter supporters were brutalized by the police at their peaceful demonstrations, and they, out, they came out in force um, to, to, to corral and to repress 
black protesters and they chose not to with this white mob because they were white. I mean, that's all you need to know. It's a simple explanation. It's called white privilege, uh, white impunity. If, if, these, if these supporters had been communists, I'm not sure whether the white privilege is... Oh, uh, well, yeah, but worked. as you know, communists aren't really white, are they? So... <laughs> <laughs> I just got white skins, but you know. Um, uh, anyway, yes. But there, yeah. there was an Indian flag flying in, in amongst all that as well, you know. So, and, and, and the point raised by James about uh, they they date Republican because they're Republicans. That's I think that's trying to draw too close a parallel with British and European politics. We vote Labour Conservative because the Labour Conservative in America. It, depending on where you're voting, a Republican can be um, like a Democrat and vice versa. You, you get Democrats in the South who are more racist than, than Republicans. Um, the party label doesn't mean so much. Um, I don't think people just voted Republican because they had a Republican candidate. They voted for Trump's policies. Um, there's a, some degree in truth about voting for a party. But it's not quite the same as in, say, Britain, where we actually vote for a party, come what may. Um, the, the other thing about America, I mean, it's, I don't know how, how much people know about American politics and structures, but beginning with a notion of government by consent only, you know, the, the American War of Independence rally and cry, um, you can't imagine how much America is organized on voting. You don't just vote for a president or Congress person or, or, or a representative. You actually vote for your dog catcher. You vote for your sheriff. Um, you vote for everything. You vote for the person in charge of schools. The whole of America is built around voting. Um, so so this, this, this idea, this notion of democracy is, um, uh, what you call bourgeois democracy is ingrained in the American psyche. It's their war of independence is based upon um, no taxation without vote. Um, uh, everything in America from, from the federal government to states, to districts, to counties, to towns, um, the person in charge of garbage collection is voted for by the townspeople, you know, this notion of democracy in America is quite bizarre, quite complex, um, and it shaped the whole psyche of American politics. Um, and uh, so, so what you've got to do in America um, is to gain the vote, turn out the vote. And that's how politics works in America. Um, and it's very sophisticated in terms of getting to the vote. Um, and, and one point I forgot to mention about analysing the rise of the far right is, of course, is the massive influence of, of the internet. Um, I mentioned all these nine diverse groups, which um, in a previous generation, you know, 30, 40 years ago, would have no contact with each other. Um, but but the connections now are made through internet and through social media. Um, um, and it's very easy now for, for um, a whole group of diverse groups to come together to ransack Congress um, through social media. And that has transformed uh, the far right in America. Um, it's brought them all together. They, they have a common purpose, uh, which is a new phenomenon know that the, the the role of social media twitter and facebook but lots of also um secret uh, web-based communication systems uh so so-called deep web um is where these where, the, where these uh, subgroups participate with each other and talk to each other um, and that's that's an added dimension to the to the threat to the far right in America. The, the use of social media um, is transformed the nature of politics. Yeah. Okay, can I come back, Hans? Abu wanted to say something. Abu wanted to say something. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, I mean, there seems to be a lot of uh, 
hysteria over, you know, these people, some of them, well, a lot of them actually, uh, are hysterical over cultural, what they call cultural Marxism. Thomas, can I say something? Okay, name. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, one of the key things that we need to look at is to why did Trump phenomenon itself happened at this stage, right? And from there, you know, I think you see, it's, it's not just a question of two groups of capitalists fighting each other. It's it's a difference in approach between Trump, Trumpism, if you want to call it, and between say, you know, the the liberal neo-colonial, uh, uh, the the, the neoconservative approach to politics. Uh, so Trump came into being because the United States is currently under severe crisis in terms of uh, capital is not a, able to make enough profits. Its, uh, its industry is shrinking. Uh, it's uh, is facing threats. Uh, you know, it's competing forces like China. So uh, the, that in itself laid the foundations around which Trumpism developed. Okay, so he used the classical method of actually, you know, pointing out to the fact that we have got an external enemy who is a real threat to us, which is China, which China is in terms of uh, economics, uh, in terms of economy, uh, and the way it's impacting on the United States. Then he said is that, you know, you are unemployed because there are other people taking your jobs. So I've got to build a wall to stop the Mexicans from coming in, which is also another classical thing. Then he also said that, you, you know, we've got internal enemies. So that was against uh, different ethnic groups living in the United States. Uh, so I think there is a different approach that Trump wanted to adopt, which is, you know, uh, he wanted to use force to, to silence the opposition, uh, whereas, liberal capitalism wanted to progress in the same way as before, but was not, was not able to. So what he was offering is that I can make America great again, provided you follow me, right? Which is not very dissimilar to what happened in, in Germany uh, before the Second World War. Hitler said, you know, we are suffering all these things. Uh, it is the, uh, other imperial powers who are restricting us from developing. So we need to go and build uh, military machinery, which is what he did. And then also he pointed to the internal uh, enemies within, and then he actually used brute force. So I think that that is the commonality between all of them. So I think Trumpism is not just a question of, you know, it's, it's going away. It's going to remain there, that force, uh, even though it may have lost current battle, but uh, it, it will come back more severely uh, at a later stage because that crisis that the United States is facing is not going to disappear. Yes, uh, Lake. And Magbul. Kalpana can go first. Oh, sorry. So so yeah, we're having problem at the moment with our connection, so I might suddenly go off. Um, thank you for the introduction and Thomas, thank you for sending all those articles as well. So um, uh, my thinking was uh, uh, sort of defining fascism or fascist, uh, the, his supporters were more fascistic. Uh, I, I thought it was more state control of um, and state organization but in, un, under the control of um... go on, Magbul. Magbul, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, many communists uh, see uh, Donald Trump. Uh, uh, they don't see Donald Trump as a leader of a fascist, racist, or right wing or organization. But they see Donald Trump as a comrade Trump because uh, he has challenged the American establishment. Even if you see uh, under the leadership of a democracy, Democrats, uh, they have waged a war in the Middle East while Trump has 
successfully withdraw military base from Afghanistan and Kurdistan and Middle East. Also, he had a large backing of middle and working class. So I think uh, the communists, they, if they analyze, they don't see in such a way that uh, uh, you can put Donald Trump in a, a fascist or racist category in a narrow sense. And he also challenged not only Democrats, but he challenged uh, his party, uh, Republicans. And he came into the power. And what he did, uh, he <laughs> used uh, Twitter, Facebook, and exposed uh, American establishment. And he didn't follow any uh, <clears throat> chain of uh, their uh, American agencies. So I think uh, he has some, and, and he, he was the first leader who uh, made uh, North Korean leader. So there is something positive. That's all I want to say. Jim has come back. Ah, yes, Lake. Yeah, uh, I'm not too sure, uh, you know, which communists actually call him Comrade uh, Donald. Uh, you won't, certainly won't find that, I don't think, in the Indian uh, uh, diaspora of, of communists, anyway. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, CPGBML, Communist Party uh, of Great Britain, Marxist Leninist. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. so, and um, although, you know, Democrats are also not a communist, they are all uh, imperialist. Yes, so anyways, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, I was going to say something just about he, what... It is a satire. It is not a, in the true sense he is a communist. But what he did, uh, a communist uh, uh, wanted, if, if, if any leader, communists cannot come into the power, but uh, Trump did in the favor of something like uh, he visited North Korea, you know, and he challenged all Republic, Republican as well as Democrats leadership. Nobody could, wanted. Could, could I just say that he did? He did come very close to uh, waging war against Iran, and he did assassinate the, the top general. He came yeah. very close to war with Iran, and uh, his Trump's own uh, generals, uh, you know, uh, I think threatened to retire, quit or something, and that's why he didn't carry out. Yeah, I just want to say something about Naheem, I'll pick up what Naheem said, uh, and that was, you know, uh, Trump's narrative is different, but I don't think in essence it is any different from the other count, uh, from, from uh, you know, so I, I'm not too sure whether there is any difference in, in approach. Uh, I mean, you, th you might think, yeah, Trump is much more anti-Black, you know, he's against black power movement and all that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, Obama actually did bugger all for the black people, you know? You know, he, he probably, in his, uh, in his uh, tenor, you know, he's probably locked up more black people in prisons and created black slaves in prison than, 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 than you know, than Trump ever did. So it, it is really, it, 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 I think you have, to, I, I think you have to be, be open-minded about these things. You know, people will, parties will come into power promising various things. And, and, and the promises that Trump made, he has not delivered on anything, right? And that's why people are saying, well, you know, he's actually quite useless. But now what we have, what we've done is we've gone to the American people about the gone from the frying pan into the fire. Next year, next election, he'll be able to so you know we, we are we are in a perpetual situation of uh, governments in America in the West in the, in the bourgeois world being run by monopoly capitalism, and I don't think there is any. Um, so, any, any I can way. continue after that. We can wind up. Yeah. And, yeah. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we we're having problems. I don't know what's going on with our internet connection. Uh, so what what I wanted to sort of uh, raise the question and, you know, the state 
organization to be fascistic. But in a way, um, United States is sort of halfway there with all the military manufacturing and exporting and few corporates controlling controlling the, well, having, uh, um, yes, having, having control of the economy and the political um, way, I think the uh, American parties are the fundraising and all that. I mean, that seems to be all very overtly, um, um, you know, you, you give donations and you get your support. I mean, that doesn't seem to happen so overtly in this country. Uh, I'm sure the same forces are um, trying to get political power, but it's a lot more open there uh, and obvious that, you know, different different companies and things will actually um, get, get try to get political powers and concessions by donating money. So it's... Uh, I, so the supporters, I think, are just on quite a small minority on the fringes, but the the sort of basis of um, developing a fascistic state is there uh, already. Um, and so, it, 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 you know, whichever party uh, or whichever candidate, so whichever person is president or vice, vice president, president is not going to make that much difference in the end, it might make minor differences, but Anyway, so sorry, that's okay. Then shall we wind up our discussion? It is. Did you want to finish his point off in the end? Yeah. <laughs> He's stuck. So... No. Yeah. Ah, James didn't finish. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's gone. You have to unmute Jim. Un Jim, Jim, you have to unmute. Yeah. It's yeah. No. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jim? No, I, I think he's having... Yeah, they're having problem. Can I can't make one last, one last point, Thomas, which um, yeah. I'm picking up Nadine's point, which I think is so important. Speaking now in terms of Marxist theory, uh, Trump, um, it, Trumpism emerged because America is an empire in decline. Um, capitalism is in chaos. It's, it's a, it's a long-term capitalist crisis. And as in 1920s, 1930s Germany, another crisis of capitalism, it throws to the front certain populist leaders um, who, who take their own particular approach to things. Um, very simply, Trumpism is an outcome, not, it's not the cause of, but is the outcome of an empire in decline. Um, an empire, an American empire, which is in long-term crisis, uh, a capitalist crisis of diminishing profits, um, being replaced by an emerging empire called China. And, and when and when you get uh, when you get uh, to empires in, in decline, uh, you get emerging populist parties, populist voices, which seek to address that decline by various means. And that's what we're seeing in America. It's a classic example of capitalism in decline and the response, the response of politicians to arrest that decline. It invariably looks at uh, internal enemies, as you say, external enemies. It picks upon immigrants, it picks upon non-white people. This is, what, this is what empires do in decline. The British empire being a classic case. Um, so let's so let's get behind the, the details of Trump and locate it within a broader Marxist context. Mm. Okay, that, that should be a material for further research. Okay, then shall we wind up? Thank, Thank, you, very you. Much. Bye. Thank you very much. Next week, we'll have uh, Radha D'Souza speaking on <laughs> agricultural struggle in India. India. Oh. I think Paul wanted to say something. Yeah, who wanted to say something? Paul, you wanted to say something?